basically they want us, uh, basically we should be drawing the mechanism and the products here. All right, so first of all, I'm taking a look at this. What, what mechanism would we expect? SM1. Mm -hmm. And why would that be? So if you're right, you definitely want to look at the substitution of the alpha carbon. Okay, good. Uh, how about you? Any opinions? Um, I'm a little bit unsure on this one. Okay, well let's see what our table says. So which row would we be in in the table uh, on page three of the SM2 handout? <coughs> We'd be in the last row. Yeah, the tertiary row. And which column are we in? We're going to be in the D2 column, strong base. Right. Because we have actually a positive sodium and negative oxygen. Right. So the first thing to notice here is, you and I talked about this last time, we have to recognize that any time we have a non-metal bonded to sodium, it's really an ionic bond. And there's really a negative charge on this oxygen over here. So we have to recognize that this has a negative charge. So who was our nucleophilic atom here? negative oxygen. Uh, well, if you look at the table uh, for negative oxygen, let me show you where that uh, comes here. So here's the negative oxygens. Um, and this is not a very bulky base. So we'd be over here uh, in this cell of the table. Remember that uh, this has some bulk, but really, uh, unless it's terpenal oxide, we usually don't think of it as being very bulky for oxygen nucleophiles. Okay, so it turns out that actually our first guess turned out not to be right here. This is not SN1, it's E2. Um, so there's a couple lessons from this. Um, so you were saying, gee, there's all this steric hindrance, so it can't be SN2. And you were absolutely right. Um, what's the big obstacle to uh, SN2? Steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. But the lesson here, and you and I talked about this last time, steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. Steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. In many ways, SN2 and E2 are similar, but they're not similar in that way. Steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. If you look at the table, E2 can take place in primary, secondary, or tertiary substrates, because steric hindrance is not a big obstacle there. So how can we decide if it's E2 or SN1? Well, it's the strength of the nucleophile or base. Because this is a very strong base, it's not going to wait around for the, the leaving group to leave. For an SN1 or E1, we'd have to wait for the leaving group to leave. But this is a very strong base. It's not going to wait. It's going to come barging in and kick the leaving group off. All right, this is a good example why it's a good idea to get in the habit of using a table like this because substitution is not the only factor that can matter for uh, what mechanism is going to happen. It's important, but it's not the only factor. Okay, so this would be E2. Um, and now we want to see if we can draw the mechanism. Well, we have to remember, um, what does the base do? The base is going to take a hydrogen. From what type of carbon does it take the hydrogen? What's our name for the carbon it takes the hydrogen from? The beta. The beta carbon. So we talked last time about how this is not going to take a hydrogen from the alpha carbon. It's going to take a hydrogen from the beta carbon. Remember that the alpha carbon is the one that's attached to the leaving group. Mm -hmm. And the beta carbon is attached to the alpha carbon. Well, here we have a difficulty because there's three beta carbons. Last time you kind of brought that up and I kind of punted on it and said we talk about that later. Well, I guess now is later. We have to talk about what to do when there's more than one beta carbon. Um, who is going to be uh, attacked over here? Well. Um, it basically comes down, uh, let's see, to uh, two things. First of all, um, do you remember, is substitution good or bad for carbocations? That's good. Yes, yeah, substitution stabilizes carbocations. Um, why? Because they're electron donor. Yeah, alkyl groups are electron donating. Um, did we talk about radicals? I guess we haven't, but would you think that substitution would be good or bad for radicals? Now, a radical is also electron deficient. A radical has only seven electrons, and it wants eight. So just like a carbocation is stabilized by alkyl groups, a radical would also be stabilized by alkyl groups. So substitution also stabilizes radicals. All right, and we know why that is now, because they're um, radicals and carbocations are electron deficient, and alkyl groups, carbon chains, are electron donating. Substitution also stabilizes alkenes. And to save time, maybe we won't talk about why that is today. Um, there is a reason for it, but uh, we won't go over the reason for that today. We'll just memorize substitution stabilizes carbocations, radicals, and alkenes. We, we've gone through the reasons for why it uh, stabilizes carbocations and radicals. 
The reason is not that complicated for alkenes, but to save time, we'll skip that for today. So we'll just memorize substitution stabilizes radicals, carbocations, and alkenes. Substitution stabilizes alkenes, which means if we're getting a choice as to where we're going to form the alkene, we would normally prefer to make the more substituted alkene, which means we would normally prefer to attack the more substituted beta hydrogen. Normally, we'd prefer to attack the more substituted beta hydrogen. Now, unfortunately, there's a complication. But the first step here is to see um, there's, a, there's a, uh, a preference for attacking the more substituted beta hydrogen because that gives you the more substituted alkene. After all, if we attack the less substituted uh, beta hydrogen, this is not a very substituted alkene. It's only attached to two carbon chains. But this alkene is attached to one, two, three carbon chains. So this, we would think there would be a preference. Now, um, and this is what's called uh, Zaitsev. Zaitsev is when you form the more substituted product by attacking the more substituted beta carbon. But there is an exception, um, which is if there's too much steric hindrance, you can't get close enough to the more substituted beta carbon. Uh, now, I said before that steric hindrance was not a big obstacle to E2, uh, but it is a mild obstacle to E2. Um, so if there's really too much steric hindrance, you have to attack the less substituted, or at least you'll get the major product of attacking the less substituted. That's called Hoffman. Hoffman elimination, where we attack the less substituted beta carbon. And the key, the steric hindrance here is steric hindrance that comes from the base. If you're using a non-bulky base, if you're using a non-bulky base, the steric hindrance is low, so you can go ahead and attack the more substituted beta carbon and form the more stabilized alkene. But if you're using a bulky base, then that's going to be too bulky to get close enough to form a lot of product with the substituted beta carbon. Instead, it's going to get into the less substituted um, beta carbon over here, and this would be the major product. So Hoffman elimination and less substituted occurs with a bulky base. Zaitsev elimination and forming the more substituted alkene occurs with a non-bulky base. Um, actually, uh, in your textbook, um, I think in this, in this chapter, you guys have only covered Zaitsev. And like in a chapter or two, you'll cover Hoffman. But we might as well go over both of them together. Um, so we've gone over both of these together. You'll see Hoffman in a chapter or two. OK. So we've gone over both of these two things together. And remember, bulky usually means very bulky, like LDA or chert butyl oxide. So this is not bulky enough to be considered bulky, usually, over here. All right. So is this going to attack the more or less substituted beta carbon? More substituted, because there's not too much bulk, not too much steric hindrance. And it would like to attack the more substituted to form the more substituted alkene, because that tends to be stabilized. So I have to draw in that hydrogen. Now, it doesn't matter whether it attacks this one or this one, because they're equivalent. These are symmetrical. So we can just pick whichever one is convenient to us. But it's definitely not going to attack, or it's definitely not going to have a major product of attacking this beta carbon, because that's the less substituted. Does that make any sense? It's a little bit more. Um, I think that you will get a mixture, and we're just saying that this is the major product. I think you'll get a mixture where this is the major product. Yeah. If they said all possible products, I might draw both, although um, I don't know if they really ask you that type of question. Okay. All right. So um, now let's go ahead and draw the mechanism for that and see if we can get that right product here. So let's see what the product would be here. We talked about how E2 is actually very complicated because there's three arrows at once. What are the three things that are happening? 
Um, well, the three things that are happening are the base still is the beta hydrogen. That frees up these electrons to form the pi bond. Remember, that's what elimination means, forming a pi bond. Well, that forces the leaving group to leave. So these three things have to happen, and they're all happening simultaneously. Here we formed our more substituted double bond. This has one, two, three carbon chains on it um, down here. And you had a little trouble drawing this product over here. Well, we know now the oxygen will be bonded to a hydrogen. Uh, and I, you drew that just fine, except you didn't draw it conventionally. I think you drew it like this. But it's just not conventional to show an OH bond like this. You've got to write it like this. All right, you just might get marked off. This is not the conventional way to show hydroxide in this situation. It has to be shown like this, uh, even though you've got the right idea in your mind. All right.